Amen. All right. Well, hey, one day, guess who? Orson. That's right. Somebody was paying attention, John. Orson was driving along this uh, rural road out here in Vegas. You know what I'm saying? And he was driving out there, John, and he saw a three-legged chicken. Yeah, a three-legged chicken. And so he was driving alongside this thing for a while. He was checking it out. It's a guy thing, right, Orson? Mm -hmm. And and he noticed that three-legged chicken was running 30 miles an hour. Yeah. And so Orson thought, he said, hey, that's that's a pretty fast chicken there. But I wonder just how fast that chicken can run, okay? So Orson, he sped up his car to 45 miles an hour, but the, the chicken stayed right alongside of him. And so then Orson decided to speed up his car again, John. And so this time, to his surprise, the chicken was still running ahead of him at 60 miles an hour. And then all of a sudden, the next thing you know, this chicken turns off the road, and he starts down this real long driveway to this farmhouse there. And so Orson, he decides to keep following it. And that's when he saw a man in the front yard that was surrounded by dozens of these three-legged chickens. Yeah. And so Orson, he yells out to the farmer from his car and he says, hey, how'd you get all these three-legged chickens? And the farmer replied, well, I breed them. You see, it's, uh, it's me, it's my wife and my son living here and we all like to eat the chicken leg. But since the chicken only has two legs, we decided to try something new. So I started breeding these three-legged varieties so we could all eat our favorite piece of chicken, right? And so Orson, he said, wow, that's amazing. How, how do they taste? And the farmer replied, don't rightly know, can't catch them. <laughs> and it's a good thing he can because those things are evil. Okay, but seriously, folks, how many guys would say that Orson had no idea the surprise he was in, apparently, that day when he took off on that journey? You know what I'm saying? Three-legged chicken, that's pretty crazy. Uh, but folks, as always, there's a punchline. Did you know the Bible says one day the whole planet, uh, not just Orson, is going to be in for a shocking journey, and that's going to happen at the rapture of the church. And the reason why it's going to be such a shocking journey is the Bible is clear. For those who refuse to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, he's the only way out of this mess. By their own doing and their own choice, they will be catapulted into the seven-year tribulation. And folks, that is not a joke. It is an outpouring of God's wrath on a wicked and rebellious planet. It's so bad that Jesus himself said it's going to be the worst time in mankind's history, worse than anything we've ever seen, and that unless God was merciful and shortened that time frame, the entire human race would be totally wiped out. But as we've been seeing, the good news is, praise God, God's not just a God of wrath and justice. He's going to have a last word on this evil and suffering we see today. And that's good news. But praise God, he's a God of love as well. Anybody? Yeah, you betcha. And because he's a God of love and he loves you and I, he's given us so many warning signs in the scripture to let us know when it's getting close. The seven-year tribulation and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Therefore, in order to keep you and I here at sunrise from experiencing the ultimate worst bad day of being left behind, worse than a three-legged chicken apparently, we're going to continue our study, that's right, called the final countdown. Okay, the final countdown. So far, we've already seen the number 10 sign on the final countdown was? Jewish people, we always get that one. The number nine sign was? Modern technology, not too bad. The number eight sign was? Worldwide. Did somebody copy my notes? That's right. (laughs) And the number seven sign was? Rise of falsehood. At least one person said that. And the last three times, if you've been seeing it, folks, is the rise of wickedness. Turn on your TV. That's how you know we're living the last days. The Bible says that once you see across the planet this increase of absolute, unadulterated wickedness in all levels of society, which is happening right now today all over the world, Thanks in part, as we've been seeing, to the rise of a wicked worldview called humanism, a wicked teaching and attack from atheism, and last week, a wicked worship called self-love, self-esteem from secular psychology that tells us we have to be lovers of cells, and yet the Bible says that once you become a society of lovers of cells, it's all going to fall apart. It's actually a clear-cut sign from God you're living in the last days. And it also explains why in the world, how did this happen? Did we go from being a great, mighty, strong Christian nation into this rise of wickedness that we see today. But that's not all. The fifth reason why we've turned from being this great, mighty Christian nation into this rise of wickedness we see today is from the promotion of a wicked lifestyle. A wicked lifestyle. Folks, what I'm talking about is hedonism. Okay? Put it all together. I don't think it's by chance. It all rolls downhill. Thanks uh, to the promotion of humanism, atheism, and selfism, it's all added up to now produce this next problem called hedonism that's given rise to the wicked behavior we today. Okay, but don't take my word for it. God once again said this is exactly what's going to happen in the last days. One more time, back to our text there in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's take a look at it, okay? We've seen that a couple times. Let's look at it one more time before we move on. But there's another nugget in here we need to pay attention to to understand how did we get into this condition with such massive wickedness all over the world. 2 Timothy, if you find 1 Timothy, what do you do? 
Ruh, ruh, ruh. That one's an easy one. I'm, I'm being kind to you after that chicken joke. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Okay, let's take a look there. And here's what he says, verses 1 through 5. Okay, here's what Paul says. He says, but mark this. In other words, pay attention. There's going to be what? What kind of days? Terrible days. Terrible times in the last days. Why? Because we saw last week, number one, people will be what? Lovers of themselves. And apparently that's going to spawn this lovers of money and boastful and they're going to be proud and abusive and disobedient to their parents and ungrateful and unholy and without love and unforgiving and slanderous and without self-control and brutal and not lovers of the good. They're going to be treacherous and rash and conceited. They're going to be what? Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of who? God, okay? And they're going to have this form of godliness, but they're going to deny its power. So what do you do with those folks? Christian? Paul's writing to the church, have nothing to do with them. Bad company corrupts good character as we saw. Now, here's the point again with bringing this passage up, okay? It tells us that we've already seen that one of the major characteristics, how do we know we're living in the last days, is it's going to be a society with absolute unadulterated wickedness, right? We've seen that several times. Last week, if you were here, put it all together, guys, because I don't think it's by chance. In the order of the text, okay, put it all together. Last time we saw the apparent root of this wicked behavior, being flooded upon society was stemming from this love of self rather than a love of God, right? It's the very first thing mentioned there. Now, here's my point with bringing this passage up one more time. Notice not the first behavior, what was the last behavior mentioned there? It's going to lead to a society where people are going to be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. It all rolls downhill and it all makes total sense if you think about it. It's the perfect capstone to this list of wicked behavior in the last days. If you start off loving yourself first, guess what you're going to do logically? You'll always end up pleasing yourself first, right? Why? Because it's the logical outcome of what we've already seen. This promotion of humanism, atheism, and, and selfism. Think about it. Listen, if man is the center of all things, humanism, and if there is no God, atheism, and you're supposed to love yourself first, selfism, what is the logical response to do after that? Party time, right? It's time to live it up, right? You've got to do whatever you want to do and please yourself as many ways as you possibly can because apparently tomorrow you die and go back to the ground to be worm bait, right? That's the logical response. You've heard the saying, right? Eat, drink, and marry because tomorrow we die. So you better live it up right now, right? Now here's the whole point with following that train, Tell me that's not the average person's attitude today. Tell me this is not the average person, dare I say, unfortunately, sometimes even Christian, that this is not their marching orders every day when they get out of bed. It's party time. Everybody's working for the weekends. Forget that. Now it's every day. It's all about pleasing myself as many ways as I possibly can before I die. Listen, this is the old-fashioned term, hedonism. It is unrestrained wickedness, and the Bible says once your society hits that, Paul says you are headed for terrible times. It's a sign of the last days, and the Bible also says it's a sign that you're about ready to be judged by God. I didn't say that. He did. Let's take a look at just two other societies that got to this level of wickedness, unadulterated, nonstop, pleasing yourself, hedonistic wickedness, and what God did to these people. Let's take the first one. The first one is Sodom and Gomorrah, Okay. Here's what God says, Genesis 19, verse 4 through 7, 24 through uh, 25. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house, Lot's house, okay? And they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Listen to the response. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind them and says, no, my friends, don't do this. Wicked thing, not acceptable thing. He said, wicked thing. And because they didn't want to listen, and, and then Lot made it out of the city, here's what happened. God judged them. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. That's where it came from. It wasn't some natural thing. Thus he, God, overthrew those cities and the entire plain, listen, including all those living in the cities and also even the vegetation of the land. How dare you live like that? But that's only one of them. Let's take a look at uh, Noah's day. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 through 7. Why did God bring the flood? Why did he judge the planet? The Lord saw how great man's wickedness had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart, man's heart, was only evil all the time. Whoa. And so the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. And so what did God do? 
He said, I'm going to wipe out mankind from whom I'm created from the face of this earth. Men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and the birds of the air. For I am grieved that I've even made them. Wow. Take something so beautiful. Life. Meant to worship God. And now all you do with that life is you continue to think about one evil thing after the next evil thing. How much evil can you accomplish? Why did God judge Sodom and Gomorrah. Why did God judge Noah's day to the point where he sent a flood and wiped them out? Because of their wicked behavior. And folks, here's the obvious point. Do you really think that God is not going to judge us? Do we really think that we're going to just escape out of here unless we turn around and repent really fast without being uh, 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 judged by God for our wicked behavior? Do we not think he's not going to judge us? Ask Israel. We have a great heritage. But oh, how far we have fallen. Folks, I really think he's getting ready to, okay? But you might be thinking, well, come on, Pastor Bill. Yeah, it's bad in society, but come on. Here in America, it's unfortunate. Things are getting a little bit bad. They're getting a little bit worse. But come on, it ain't as bad as it was back in Sodom and Gomorrah's day and Noah, is it? Yes, it is. I'm just going to share with you a list of just some headlines I put together this week. Some headlines and some articles I've been saying. And you tell me, folks, if we're not getting ready to get judged here in America, we better repent as a nation and as the church or we're in a heap of trouble. Let's take a look at some of those headlines, folks. Uh, schools right now are teaching kids that religion is a disease. And uh, entertainers are saying that the Bible is a work of fiction. Uh, New York City principal nixes the song, God Bless the USA, at kindergarten graduation. Can't do that. And listen, the kids went ahead and tried to do it anyway. And I'm not kidding you. I got the article. The adults around them were chanting back to the kids, burn in hell, burn in hell, burn in hell. That's how wicked we are getting, and that's the tip of the iceberg. Divorce cakes have now become the new trim, and I'm talking big cakes, you know, like multiple tier ones. That's the new trim. They're called separation parties, just as big as a wedding. That's the new thing. Excuse me? Uh, 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 there's, there's an epidemic growth of internet porn being cited here in America. Sexually transmitted disease rates have literally hit record highs in the United States. Uh, the Girl Scouts, that got the report, are now supporting abortion and sexual promiscuity. MTV wants you to lose your virginity in a new reality show. Okay, is how bad it's getting. Uh, the UN is calling for the legalization of prostitution worldwide. Excuse me. And a PC game has been released. Uh, call, it's called Rayplay that allows players to gang rape virtual women and then force them to have an abortion. I'm not making none of this up. This is how big, how wicked we are getting evil all the time. And that's still the tip of the iceberg. A chastity ring has become the source of a new problem in school. A Christian teenager is going to court this summer to challenge the decision of her school to ban her from wearing a celibacy ring on school grounds. They're going to court over it. Excuse me? Uh, and, and a live baby was treated as medical waste. Uh, crematorium workers found an infant crying in medical waste receptacle on its way to being cremated. Just chucked it in the can. Well, why would people do that? Well, why are people doing this? Planned Parenthood kills 329,445 babies in one year using 487.4 million in our taxpayer dollars. We're paying for it. In fact, since 1973, in America alone, we have murdered 54,559,615 babies at the time that I wrote this down. This is almost 10 times the amount of people killed in Hitler's Holocaust. And around the world, just since 1980, not even 1973, we have murdered 1.3 billion children. And we don't think we're going to be judged. We are an absolute murderistic society. According to the new health care law, even pro-life Americans will be forced to pay for other people's abortions. And British teens are having as many as seven abortions growing up. Okay, and a female student believes that uh, abortion is a medium for art and she will be allowed to display her senior art project, which is a documentation of a nine month process during which she artificially inseminated herself as often as possible while periodically taking abortion drugs to induce on purpose miscarriages. Her exhibition will feature video recordings of these forced miscarriages as well as preserved collections of the blood from the process, but you can't bring a Bible to school. This is how wicked, folks, we are getting, and it's getting worse. Undertakers are now washing dead bodies down the drain, forget to burying, forget even cremating. They're using a chemical, a caustic solution, and they're just flushing the bodies down the drain. Who cares, right? We don't honor life in the womb. I'm telling you, folks, it's working its way towards the middle. Now they're going to start with the other side and head this way as well. But it gets even worse. A publicly funded expedition encouraged people to deface the Bible in the name of art. Try that with the Quran. And here's what they did in the name of art. 
supposedly. Visitors responded with abuse and obscenity such as, this is all sexist blank, so disregard it all. And another wrote on the first page of Genesis, I am bi, female, and proud. I want no God who is disappointed in this. Okay, the U.S. is using foreign aid to promote gay rights around the world. Pentagon is uh, recently held its first gay pride event. Uh, politicians are saying they're now okay with a, a second grade teacher reading a gay prince fairy tale called King and King to the kids. No problem with that. Okay, and thousands of schools across the nation here in the United States are observing the homosexual sponsored day of silence. In a nationwide push to promote homosexual lifestyle in public schools, students are taught that homosexuality is a worthy lifestyle, that it has few or little or no risk, that individuals are born homosexual and cannot change, and those who oppose such teachings are characterized as ignorant, hateful bigots in the school. I just thought little Johnny and Susie were going to school, learning, reading, writing, and not anymore. We saw that before, folks. Recent California laws will be requiring all public schools instruction to positively portray homosexuals, transsexuals, bisexuals to children as young as kindergarten, and another California law barring people from, quote, curing gay children was signed into law last Sunday, I believe. It still gets worse. Pro proposed law would force churches to now host gay weddings. And see, we say, oh, no, we'll never do that. Unfortunately, the church is sliding too. A play, I believe this was in Florida, depicting Jesus as gay, packed the church out. Oh, it gets worse. Another church had a lesbian nativity scene that was being promoted and quote, and when the Holy Family arrived, it was two women with their baby. If you think that's bad, recently a new version of the Last Supper came out in San Francisco. Amidst black leather tattoos and feather boas, homosexuals pose as the apostles, who in the original painting are depicted gathered at the table with Jesus to partake of the last meal together, right? Well, in the new version, the table no longer has the traditional bread and wine symbolizing Christ's body and blood being given for us, but rather sex toys symbolizing the God of sex and unlicensed physical pleasure, you know, hedonism. And Nancy Pelosi stated on record, quote, Christianity has not been harmed by this. Excuse me? And finally, folks, a publication is now out promoting incestuous pedophilia as healthy sex ed. Booklets from Family Affairs encourage parents to sexually massage their children as young as one to three years of age. And psychologists, you know the guys we saw from last week? They are now pushing to decriminalize pedophilia. You open up Pandora's box. You remove the standard of what is right and wrong. It gets worse. And it'll get worse than even that unless we turn around, folks. And we still don't think we're gonna get judged. We don't think it's as, oh yeah, it's bad, but it's not as bad as it got back in Sodom and Gomorrah and G Genesis, the flood. Yes, it is. I like what one guy said this. He said, what in the world has happened to America? Tell me if this doesn't sound true. He said, it seems that America has become the land of the special interest and the home of the double standard. If we lie to Congress, it's a felony. But if Congress lies to us, it's just politics. The government spends millions to rehabilitate criminals, but they do almost nothing for the victims. In public schools, you can teach homosexualities, okay, but you better not bring in the word of God. You can kill an unborn child, but it's wrong to execute a mass murder. We don't burn books in America, we simply rewrite them. We got rid of the communist social threat by renaming it progressives. If you protest the president, you're a terrorist. But if you burn an American flag, it's your supposed First Amendment right. You can have pornography on TV or the internet, but you better not bring in that nativity scene in a public park at Christmas time. And we can use aborted, murdered babies for medical sure, uh, research, but it's wrong to use an animal. And we take money from those who work hard for it and give it to those who don't want to work, and we still have freedom of speech, but only when you're being politically correct. And parenting has now been replaced with Ritalin and video games. What has happened to the land of the free and the home of the brave? As one guy said, it's turned into the land of the fee and the home of the slave. How did this happen to us? Folks, when you read the Bible, it makes total perfect sense. I'll tell you why. Because we've turned into Sodom and Gomorrah. We have gone into full-blown hedonism. We've turned into a hedonistic, seek-yourself pleasure society, nonstop. And the Bible says, once you do that, you are headed for judgment. One guy said this to me, he said, if God doesn't judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. But can I tell you something? God is not in the apologizing, making business. And unless we turn around and repent as a nation, even as Christians, we are headed for judgment. And if you don't want to listen to me, if you don't want to listen to the other passages that are our example, listen to Jesus Christ. 
Jesus clearly said that once the world once again becomes just as wicked as Noah, just as wicked as Sodom and Gomorrah, he's getting ready to come back. And he's going to judge us this time. Okay, I didn't say that he did. Matthew 24, here's what Jesus said. Verses 37 through 39, he said, as it was in the days of who? Noah, Noah you know, was continually wicked all the time. Okay, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. For why? What happened? Well, in the days before the flood, people were what? You know, hedonism, pleasure time, eating and drinking and partying and marrying and giving in marriage up until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing. They knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. Listen to what Jesus says. And therefore, that is how it's going to be again at the coming of the Son of Man. That's what your society is going to look like right before Jesus comes back. And folks, the, the past is there. We're not just seeing a repeat of that wicked behavior just like in Noah's day, evil all the time. But we're seeing a repeat of the same nonchalant, whoop de doo dah attitude concerning the coming of Christ. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. What, what, what do people around us say today when we lovingly tell them about the return of Jesus Christ and God's impending judgment? What's their attitude? It's the same thing. Yeah, all right. Yeah, come on. You Christians have been saying that for what you do, blah, blah, blah. Pass the chips. Right? It's the exact same thing. You guys are wackos. What are you, some sort of Noah? They went right on, and our society does the same thing. They just go right on back. We'll tell them all about Jesus. We'll tell them you better wake up. This is the time. We're getting close. We don't know the day nor the hour, but it's going to come. You need to be ready. Let's go back to partying and eating and drinking and marrying and giving a marriage. <laughs> it's no big deal. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but we are hitting crisis times. Church historians are saying right now that this generation of Christians, unless we turn around, we have gone over the precipice and we will not come back. This is it. We have to repent as a nation. We have to repent as the church and get right with God now if there's any hope of turning this thing around. Like this guy says, listen to this. Listen to the people beating on Noah's ark before the rain came. This is wild. When God said, come into the ark, you and all your household, Noah saw God close the ark. And the people on the outside didn't. I wonder if he slept those seven days before the rains came. I know if it was me, I couldn't have slept. I know there were sleepless nights that I have. And I'm pondering the things of God and what he has showed me and what is coming to this country. Can you sleep? I don't see how you can sleep at night. The bingo halls are full. But the churches are empty. And you may be saying, Sam, but my church is full. Full of what? Dead men's bones? The casinos are full, but no one will give to God? Concerts are packed, but no one will praise the Almighty. We will scream and shout for a rock star, but sit quietly bored when hearing about God Almighty. We will sit through a movie for two hours, but we can't even pray for two hours. We will drive out of state for a game or a race. We can't even get up on Sunday morning or Sunday nights or Wednesday to hear the word of God. And these are so-called Christians that do this. Not only is the world asleep and the fire is getting ready to come upon this earth, but the Christians are asleep. This is Christians that do this. They give God crumbs while they die on the fruits of the world. They demand unconditional love, and they give God lip service. They demand blessing, though they curse His name. They demand the flesh, but they crucify the Spirit. They say we can't go to church every time the doors are open, but they can take their kids to football, baseball, basketball, wrestling, dance, circus, the fair, or just sit in front of a TV all night long. But going to be in the presence of the Heavenly Father is just too much to ask for them. We will work 8, 10, 12 hours a day to pay the bills and buy the bass boat. But we will tell the one who breathed life into us, one hour should do, God. 
We sit in church, but we are godless. We have a form of godliness, but we deny the power thereof. I don't see how the lukewarm Christians can sleep at night. Before the rains came, I believe Noah couldn't sleep, but the world outside was sleeping just fine. They fell asleep. If it were today, they would have fallen asleep watching TV. They would have just gotten home from their favorite game or their movie. They would have been doing everything under the sun, eating and drinking and being merry, not knowing that tomorrow they shall die. You cannot say you were not born. In Luke chapter 21, verse 11, it says, And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines and pestilences, and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. In verse 25, it says, But for blessing, the sea and the waves roaring. You can't say you were not born. You cannot say you had not a no one that did not preach to you for 120 years because you ignored him. You said, who is that man? Oh, that's just Noah. He's going to the church house. That's just Noah. He's always talking negative. That's just Noah. Let's go back to sleep. Oh, at least when Jesus was praying in the garden, when the disciples slept, at least they woke up. When the servants slept and the enemy came and sowed the tares, at least the, the servants woke up. But when Jesus Christ comes back, His kingdom will be likened unto the ten virgins, the five wise and the five foolish, and they will be sleeping, all of them. Oh, that we may open our eyes and see, see what is coming. But yet, we sleep on. God have mercy. May God have mercy on us. Why, God? How, how did this happen? How did, our, how did our great and mighty, strong, godly heritage of a nation turn into such a society of wickedness and rebellion just like in Noah's day, just like in Sodom and Gomorrah? How did it happen? I'll tell you why. The Bible tells us this is exactly what's going to happen once you go down this route. We allow the infiltration of a wicked lifestyle into our schools, into our media, into our hearts, even into the church called hedonism. And we fit the final stage. We've hit it. We're now, it's nothing but pleasure. We seek to be pleasures of ourselves, not God. Once you go down this continual promotion of humanism, Atheism and selfism, it's the logical response. And I'll say it again as the video has clearly told us. Folks, if there's any hope for our nation, we the church better repent and we the church better get back on track and show them the way out of this mess. Amen? That's not the sixth reason why we've turned from a great and mighty Christian nation given rise to this wickedness we see today is the promotion of this wicked belief. There's a wicked belief that we allowed in. That's justifying this supposedly. It's illogical. We'll see that in a second. And that wicked belief system is called relativism. Okay? This is the question. How did he do it? How in the world did Satan get us, here, even here in America, with our godly heritage to justify this wicked behavior, this hedonistic lifestyle, to the point where it's no big deal? Did you bring the salsa? Well, again, it's from this lie called relativism. And for those of you who don't know, relativism is the belief system where there is no right or wrong. In other words, you get to make it up as you go. You get to do whatever feels right. Maybe you've heard the classic saying in our society today, whatever is true for you is true for you. But whatever is true for me is true for me. How many guys heard that? That's, that's what it is, okay? It's all out there. It's very popular today. It's called relativism, where truth is relegated to the person themselves instead of God. Okay, that's what it is, okay? But the Bible clearly warns us once you go down, do whatever you feel is right according to you and not God, you're headed for trouble. The Bible actually warns about this kind of belief system. Two passages very quickly. Judges chapter 17, verse 6 says this. In those days, there was no king in Israel. There was no standard of right and wrong. There was nobody saying, no, the buck stops here. And so what did the people do? 
Here was their attitude. Everyone did what was what? Right in their own eyes. Who gives a report? God says, it's all based on how I feel. And then Deuteronomy warns us this, uh, chapter 12, verse 8, you shall not, not ponder, maybe it's not a good idea, you shall not at all do as we're doing here today, every man doing whatever's right in his own eyes. Why, why, why should we do it? Because if you read the context of the passages, if you look at what happened to the Israelites, if you look at what happened in the book of Judges over and over again when the people did that and went away from the standard of God, it always led to trouble, always led to destruction. And this is why our founding fathers who built this great nation did so, as we've seen before, on the grand, great, awesome, absolute principles of God's word. This is why Andrew Jackson said, that book, sir, the Bible, is the rock on which our republic rests. Why? Because they knew, because it's almost like they read their Bibles, they knew that well, the last thing you ever wanted to do was to do what Israel did, getting to the point in your society where, quote, we do as we're doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in their own eyes. Why? Because it will destroy your nation and will lead to horrific trouble. Why? Because there's no longer any standard. There's no stability. Everybody gets to do whatever they want to do. It leads to absolute, utter chaos, and your society will fall apart. And besides, relativism, folks, is not only dangerous as we see in the Bible, it's ludicrous. Because truth by its very nature is absolute. It's dogmatic. Otherwise, it wouldn't be true. Let me give you some examples. Two plus two will always be four. Whether you like it, lump it, leave it or not. Try putting two plus two equals five on your math test and you're going to get a what? An F every single time. <laughs> That's not right. My feelings told me it was five. Don't damage my self-esteem. In my world, I think it's five. Who cares? Anybody glad that when somebody's building your house with mathematics, building that plane that you're flying in with mathematics follows the absolute laws and rules of mathematics and don't just make it up as you go? <laughs> Math doesn't care how you feel about truth. It's true whether you like it or not. That's what makes it true. It's dogmatic. It's absolute. Let me give you another example. You can think all you want. In my heart, I feel that I can jump out of this airplane and fly upwards without a parachute. I guess you have that right to feel that way. It doesn't make it true. You're going to learn very quickly that the truth of science and the thing that you learned in science that's absolute called gravity is going to turn you into road peats in a few seconds. Right? One more example. I think you're starting to get the point about how ludicrous this is. Okay? In any arena of life. You can feel in your heart very sincerely that Abraham Lincoln was not the 16th president of the United States. He was a wild west cowboy. Yeehaw! He was out there roping those three-legged chickens. Hey, you can believe that all you want. You put that on your history exam, what are you going to get every single time? What are you, that's an intolerant teacher. No, truth by its very nature is absolute, otherwise it wouldn't be true, okay? And besides, think about it, folks. Uh, when somebody says, there, are, there is no right and wrong, there are no absolutes, what did they just say? They just made an absolute statement. Think about it. It's absolute, you can't escape it. Okay, and folks, sincerity of opinion is no measuring rod for something to be right. All it means is you can be sincerely wrong. And even Abraham Lincoln <laughs> knew the ludicrousness of this belief system of relativism. This is a true story. He brought this up in a debate. He, he was trying to make a, a point uh, to his opponent, and they were unconvinced and stubborn. So Lincoln tried another tactic. He said to the man, he says, well, now, let, let's see. H how many legs does a cow have? And the guy came back really disgusted. Well, well four, of course. Stupid question. And Lincoln came back and he says, that's right. Now, suppose you call a cow's tail a leg, how many legs does the cow have? And the opponent came back to Lincoln real confident, well, five, of course. And then Lincoln came back, now that's where you're wrong. Calling a cow's tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. Now, me personally, if that's all you had to do to produce more meat on a cow, I'd get excited about it. You know what I'm saying? That's, a lot, that's, that's much more meat to eat on that critter, you know what I'm saying? But folks, it doesn't change a thing. Even if I did do that, it wouldn't change a thing. But here's my point. It doesn't keep us from trying, especially when it comes to moral behavior in our society. Jeffrey Baker shares how people today morally are calling a cow's tail a leg and trying to get us to accept it by simply redefining morality. Here's what he says. He says, what our founding fathers referred to as drunkenness because of their Christian heritage, we now just call alcoholism. And we deem that a social disease rather than a sin. 
What the law word called sodomy, we now just call alternative lifestyle. Pornography is the perversion that brings death to a nation, but now we just call that thing adult entertainment. And what our founding fathers called immorality, we just now call the new morality. What the law called adultery or fornication, we just say, hey, it's stepping out, it's just fooling around. And what the law called abhorrent social behavior, like stealing or filthy language, we just now call abnormal social development or anti-social behavior. So, doesn't change it. I don't know about you guys, but I don't know if you know this much. I hope you do about God's character. Uh, He is not going to change his mind on sin just because we changed the name of sin. It gets worse. This relativistic mindset has gotten so deep, so popular today that people are not just redefining sin, saying, no, 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 it's how I feel about it. Who cares what the Bible says? But it's gotten so bad that they are now demanding our praise and full acceptance of it or we're the new bigot. And what they've done, I'm going to share this, this hopefully was a big eye-opening for you. They've redefined the term called tolerance. And the tolerance that's being taught to our children today in the public school system is a whole different tolerance than what we've been brought up with. And they're brainwashing the kids to now say that if you're going to be a tolerant person, it means you accept anything, no matter how wicked it is. Josh McDowell brings this out. Let's take a look. Some of you say, wait a minute, I thought tolerance was good. That's the problem. That's the problem. Little Johnny comes home from school and that very sincere Christian mother from the most fundamental evangelical church meets little Johnny. Says, honey, how was school today? Oh, mommy, we t- what'd you talk about? We talked about tolerance. And that Christian mother goes, oh, that's wonderful. You know, Jesus taught us to be tolerant. Absolutely not. That mother is undermining everything that she believes, and it won't take years. it only take months to come back and halt her. You say, wait a minute, I don't get this. The reason is this. Right now, there's two distinct separate definitions of tolerance. One, I call historical or traditional tolerance. It's a one that almost every one of us is here been conditioned to think by, and how you're listening to me through traditional tolerance, I am speaking from a whole new definition of tolerance. Traditional tolerance would be defined by Webster, to bear or put up with someone or something not especially liked. Or in our circles we'd say, you know, God has called me as a Christian to love the sinner but to hate the sin. That's one of the most bigoted statements you can make today. You make that every statement in every classroom today, and that entire class would turn on you the bigotry, the intolerance to say, love the sinner, hate the sin. The reason is, there's a second definition of tolerance. And I would say 80% of the time, outside the walls of the church, when you hear the word tolerance, whether the media, magazine, school, or what, it is not the tolerance you're conditioned to think by. It's a whole new definition of tolerance. 80% of the time, it's a new definition. The tolerance you were brought up with is now referred to as negative tolerance, The new tolerance is called positive tolerance. It's defined this way. Every single individual's values, beliefs, lifestyle, and claims to truth are equal. Then repeat that. All values, all beliefs, all truth, all lifestyles are equal. And if you dare to say there's a value, belief, a lifestyle, or a claim to truth greater than another, that is called hierarchy, and that's the new definition of bigotry. A bigot today has nothing to do with racism or anything. A bigot today is someone who's committed to moral hierarchy that there's difference in values, beliefs, lifestyle, or claims to truth. Positive tolerance adds the word praise. And what it means is this. We not only want your permission, we demand your praise. And if you do not praise my value, my lifestyle, my claim to truth as equal to your own, now listen to this, as equal to your own from the heart, you are a bigot and you are intolerant from the heart. It's called positive tolerance. Let me show you just how it's hit the church, just in a little brief one. Can you tell me historically what's been the number one verse quoted from the scriptures by Christians, non-Christian, Christian young people, non-Christian young people, the media, everything? What's the number one verse quoted historically by the scriptures? John 3, 16. 
Do you know what it is now? Have you all been listening? Have you been listening to your own young people? Can anyone tell me now, by far way out front of everything, what's the number one verse quoted even by Christian young people from the Bible? Number one now, what is it? Judge not that you be not judged. Listen. Why? The moment you make a judgment, you're saying there's hierarchy. And that makes you a bigot and intolerant. And it makes you stand against the number one virtue in culture, tolerance. All is equal. Christian love and the number one virtue of culture today cannot coexist. In fact, I'll go as far to say that Christian love is the number one enemy of the number one virtue in culture, tolerance. In fact, men and women, I'll say this. I believe now it's a point as a pastor, evangelist, someone like that, it is very difficult to be popular and faithful. Jesus loved that woman at the well. And in love and compassion, he said to her, go call your husband. She said, sir, I don't have a husband. In loving compassion, Jesus said, that's right. You've had five husbands and the one you're living with now is not your husband. Jesus exposed her lifestyle. He was witnessing to her. He exposed her lifestyle. Now speak to me. Did Jesus expose her lifestyle as an alternate lifestyle or a sinful lifestyle? You're a bigot. What right do you have to say that? You're intolerant. Who do you think you are to have the corner on truth? What right do you have to make any moral judgment on someone? He did it in love. If you don't believe me, that's not true. You try it anywhere in culture right today. You just traveled me one week into the high schools and universities. And Jesus did it in love. Christian love and tolerance cannot coexist. We better wake up. Why? Because as Josh McDowell is saying, folks, everything that we believe in as Christians is at utter risk. Because of this changing of the terminology, it still doesn't make it right, but because of this changing of the terminology and this new definition of tolerance, you and I, the evangelical fundamental Christian, is going to become the new enemy of the state. All that we believe in, all of Christianity, all of the scripture is based on absolutes that does not and cannot tolerate this. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, not one of many. The Bible declares that there is only one God, not several, or that you can become one. The very Ten Commandments are not suggestions. They are absolute statements, orders from God of right and wrong. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not commit adultery. And besides, if there is no right and wrong, why do we have a judicial system? Why do we have courts of law? Why do we dare prosecute somebody and send him or her to jail against their own wishes? If everybody's uh, 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 belief style was just following their claim of truth, where's the distinction? What if it was somebody's values to uh, molest their children? Is that right? Every ounce of your being says no. But if you buy into this new definition of tolerance, you would have to say yes. That's why even pedophilia, the psychologists are trying to decriminalize it. Because those people, as wicked as that is, that's their claim to truth. What if it was another person's value to teach their children to steal for a living? What if it was a mother's value to teach her daughter a fulfilling lifestyle called prostitution? Is it any wonder the UN is now trying to legalize it? What if it was a father's value to teach his son to be an abuser of women? If everyone's values, beliefs, lifestyles, claim to truth are equal, then logically, does that mean we need to accept what Hitler did as okay? I'm sure he was just following his claim to truth. What are you being a bigot? Are you intolerant? If there are no absolutes, this is why everything's upside down, folks, even in the church. If there are no absolutes, you're going to end up having to deal with this. That means there is no difference between an Adolf Hitler and a Franklin Graham. Why, God? Why? How did this happen? How did our nation turn into such wickedness? It's because of this. It all rolls downhill. The Bible's given us the answer all this time, 2,000 years ago. It's because we allow the infiltration of a wicked lifestyle called hedonism and a wicked belief that supports it and supposed to justify it called relativism. And the Bible says once you hit that society, you are headed for some serious bad times. 
I didn't say that God did. Isaiah 520 says this, listen to the society of that day. Whoa, that's a bad thing. Not slow down, horsey. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now here's the point. Tell me that's not what a society is doing today. Are they not calling good evil? What the Bible says is right and wrong. Are they not saying that evil is now good? Are they not exchanging darkness for light? We're living in those same times. And Isaiah so long ago says, when your society gets like this, listen, he says, you're headed for woeful times. Or as Paul says, you're headed for terrible times in the last days. Therefore, as we close, if there's any hope for our nation, folks, we better get busy calling upon the name of Jesus Christ. Why? Because contrary to popular opinion, he is the only way to escape the wrath of God that is coming. Like it, lump it, leave it or not, it's an absolute truth. He is the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by him. Not a way, not a truth, not a life. He's it, period. No matter how you feel about it. There's only one way out of this mess, folks. His name is Jesus Christ, and we need to get busy calling upon his name to escape the wrath that is coming upon this planet that God said would happen 2,000 years ago, and it's getting close. But we better make sure that we're right with God, even in the church. We are not saved by our works. Praise God for that, anybody? But the Bible is clear. There's a lot of people who profess Jesus Christ, but their lives are saying a different story. They're living just like the world. I don't know the heart, but God does. You might fool me. You might fool Sunrise, but you cannot fool God. And you need to make sure today and call upon the name of Jesus Christ. We'll close in prayer after this. you can't live with it and you whimper and cry and ask God for a little help and then you go right back with your hand and your eyeball firmly attached. Oh yes, once in a while you take a dull paring knife and scratch your hand and occasionally you, you scratch around your eyeball but you haven't begun to cut off and pluck out. You better listen to the words of Jesus. Not everyone who says Lord, Lord shall enter but he that does the will of my Father in heaven. If ye by the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, ye shall live. If you live after the flesh, you'll die. The cross does not give us a minor shift or two with regard to a few of our ethical and moral and religious values. The cross radically disrupts the very center and citadel of your life from self to Christ. And if the cross has not done that, you're not a Christian. My friend, face it. Young or old, you're not a Christian. Until the cross has radically disrupted the very center and 
citadel of your life and brought you from a life of commitment to serve self, whether it's religious self, moral self, proud self, covetous self, lustful self, prideful self, unforgiving self, lazy self. It doesn't matter what are the focal points of the reign of your self. If you've gone to the cross in union with Christ, it's been shattered. I want you in that day when you stand with me before the judge of the world to have him say, come you blessed. Come you blessed. I don't want to look at you standing there saying, Lord, 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 I named you in earth. I named you before the elders. I named you before the church. I named you in prayer meeting. I named you in witness. And Lord, now, Lord, Lord, did I not this? Did I not that? I don't want to hear him say, depart from me. I never knew you. You worker of anything. You never were made a doer of the will of God. You learned enough, and you learned what to say properly enough to be accepted for what you professed yourself to be on earth. But now the day of judgment has come, and the truth is now to be known. Well, hi, this is Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church, and I hope you enjoyed today's study. But before you go, let me ask you one final question. Are you sure that if you were to die today, that you go to heaven and not hell? Before you answer that, let me share a couple things with you. Did you know that the Bible says that God is holy and that we are not? And the Bible also says that the wages of our sin or our unholiness is death. In other words, when we die, and it's coming for each one of us, we're all marching towards the grave at different speeds, but it's going to happen. The Bible says, therefore, since the wages of our sin is death, we deserve to die and go straight to hell and not to heaven. And that's bad enough, but to make matters worse, we don't want to admit this. God already knows. He knows uh, all of our behavior, everything, our thoughts, what we've done, what even we're going to do. He knows it all. He's gone. Even though he already knows this, we don't want to admit this. And so out of love and mercy, God gave us something called his law or the Ten Commandments. It's kind of like his x-ray into our heart to show us what he already knows, that he is holy and that we are not. And it's this unholiness or sin that separates us from him. Let's take a look at God's x-ray, if you will, his divine law, to show us what he already knows. The Ten Commandments, uh, the ninth one, says this, you shall not bear false witness. Okay, that's called lying. Okay, and if you've ever told a lie once, which we all have, myself included, the Bible says that makes you a liar. Okay. The, the, another commandment says, you shall not steal, okay? Uh, and you might think, well, that's something that everybody does. Well, it doesn't make it right, and it demonstrates what God is trying to show us, that uh, we all have sin, and it's separating us from him. Even if you took a pencil in the third grade from somebody, if you did it without permission, that's stealing. And so now you've become a thief. The Bible says that you shall not use the Lord's name in vain, and how interesting it is and unfortunate that the only name under heaven by which men might be saved, the name Jesus Christ, has now become a common cuss word. The Bible says that God is so holy that even his name is holy. If you've taken the Lord's name in vain and used it as a cuss word or even flippantly, the Bible calls that the sin of blasphemy. And so now you become a blasphemer. The Bible says you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus says if you even look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. And finally, the Bible says, uh, you shall not murder. And you might think, well, hey, I haven't done that one. Really? Well, again, the Bible says that the sin of hatred is the same as the sin of murder. The only difference is you pulled the trigger, if you will, in your heart. You wish they were dead. And in God's eyes, it's the same thing in principle. Folks, that's only just a couple of the Ten Commandments. We didn't even go through all of them. But I think you're starting to get the picture. The Bible is correct. We have all fallen short of the glory of God, myself included. And that we are separated from God as a result. And so when our time comes, we're not automatically going to heaven. 
We are headed for judgment. We are headed for hell. Now let me tell you the good news. The good news is that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to save us. Jesus Christ died on the cross. It was the death penalty of its day. He paid in full uh, the price for our sins to be forgiven. Let me give you an analogy. For instance, even today, we could see that a person could commit a crime. Uh, they, they cannot reverse it. The, the sentence has been passed. The judge has uh, slammed his gavel, and they are ushered off into their jail cell. And in this particular crime, they are going to receive the death penalty. And so they're behind bars just waiting for the time, waiting for the call for them to go and uh, receive the death penalty. But believe it or not, as we know, there is a way that a person can get off a death row. And that is if the one in authority, the governor, would grant them a pardon. Now, they didn't earn it. Uh, they certainly don't deserve it. And there's nothing they could do uh, to earn it because nothing can reverse their crime. Okay? Yet the one in authority has that ability to grant them a pardon. Well, can I tell you something? That's what God has done through Jesus Christ. The cross was the death penalty of the day. God sent his one and only son to die on the cross, to take the death penalty in our place, and that if we would just receive his pardon for all of our sins, God is willing to allow us to get off a death row. He's willing to forgive us completely of all of our sins. That's the good news that I want to share with you. God loves you. The Bible says that God is not willing that anyone should perish, but everyone come to repentance. Won't you, if that's you, call upon the name of Jesus Christ right now? Won't you ask him to forgive you of your sins? The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Won't you do that now, wherever you are? Please, take God up on his amazing, loving offer. I'll let you down. Man will let you down. People will let you down. But God never will. He wants to adopt you into his forever family. He loves you. He's willing to forgive you of anything and everything you've ever done, past, present, and future. It's amazing. Please, call upon Jesus now. Well, this has been Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church. If there's anything that we can do for you, please don't hesitate to ask. Our number and information will come up here on the screen here shortly. And remember, I hope to see you in heaven. God bless. Thank you for watching this presentation from Sunrise Baptist Church. If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 1780 Betty Lane, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89156. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-452-8599 or email us at bcrone at getalifemedia.com or you can visit our website at www.getalifemedia.com. Billy Crone and this ministry can also be found on Facebook and Twitter. Join us for services at www.sunriselv.com.